Hi, everybody. Welcome to the fourth annual Goldsmiths Queer History uh, Lecture, um, this year delivered by Dr. Benno Gamerl. My name is Justin Bengry. I'm director of the Center for Queer History at Goldsmiths and convener of the MA Queer History. I'm really delighted that we are, that we're still running the uh, the lecture this year. It's a bit delayed. We normally have it in, in the autumn, um, but uh, while well, circumstances being what they are, it's, uh, it's happening now and I'm delighted that you could join us. And I'm delighted that Benno has uh, been able to join us today from Florence. Um, I'm also really happy that this year it's a it's a co-production, um, and this year we are uh, co-hosting the annual lecture with the newly established Goldsmiths uh, History Society, um, who've already been really active this year and such great participants in the department and such a such a feature of of, of the department and the and the culture that's building um, in the history department. So I'm I'm really pleased to uh, to welcome our students to the event and welcome members of the uh, Goldsmiths History Society. So the the annual lecture really is a highlight every year of of the departmental calendar. And 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 like I said, even if it's even if it's late by by a few months this year, um, it's 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 special to me that we could continue to uh, to hold it this year. Um, and uh, it's it's really special to me too that we could welcome back. Um, our colleague Benno Gamerl, who has well been with us since the start, and uh, and this is a great way to celebrate uh, uh, Benno's successes, celebrate Benno's contributions to the queer history program, um, and and everything that's going forward with him uh, uh, now in in Italy at the European University Institute. So. Over the last year, uh, I don't need to tell you that it's uh, it's been well. It's been quite a year. This is the, the the lecture is often a chance to reflect on on what's been going on in the queer history program over the last year, and we've obviously been thrown into um, incredibly difficult circumstances that impacted our our last cohort and that our new cohort came in this year um, uh, this year uh, uh, under the under the cloud of. So uh, it's 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 just been exceptional circumstances in which we've gone through a series of lockdowns limited access to sources, teaching online and remotely, and uh, really my thanks to all of our students for persevering with us and my colleagues as well. This has been uh, quite, a, quite a challenging time. Um, and I want to acknowledge, of course, the challenges that, um, that we've all faced and the difficulties that we've faced in this last year. Certainly a number of staff and students have fallen ill. Um, some of us have lost loved ones and we've suffered in many other ways through, through the last year. Um, so it's especially significant to me that we're able to come together like this and that we're able to celebrate, um, well, the achievements of students over the last year in the MA program um, and, and our guests and our, and our speaker. Um, I really like each year to just uh, share with people that aren't part of the MA Queer History Program the kind of work that's being done by our students and by our graduates. And there's been, in spite of everything, such an incredible range of, of dissertations and research that's been done. And just to like really quickly skim over some of it to give you a sense of the incredible work that our students do. Uh, a sample of some of the dissertations that came through from last year's cohort um, and then now uh, people that have finished more recently. Um, we've had dissertations that looked at reading Vogue, the magazine Vogue as a queer publication, the colonial application of the gender binary and how that perpetuated colonialism uh, from the 16th century to, to really the present. Um, other, another student looked at um, early 20th century gay personal ads and the international networks that they fostered. Someone else historicized productions of Edward II. We've had amazing work on marketing to LGBTQ consumers, intersections of fat and queer activism, um, early modern gossip and slander, the politics of lesbian feminism, um, and lesbian SM communities and their histories. I mean, you can see just from all of that, the incredible range in terms of period, content, interests, identities that are being explored um, in, the, um, uh, in the MA queer history. And then, like I said, our newest cohort that started this year um, has been almost entirely online. And what an experience we've had. It's been just, it's been a challenge, but I have to say, uh, having taught 100% online this year, what an incredible privilege it was working with such fantastic students, such dedicated students and such engaged students. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's wonderful to have this opportunity to, uh, to, to thank you and celebrate you as well. Um, and I, I, I look forward to Benno's lecture and I also look forward well to continuing the series into the future going forward. Um, 
in a year of all of these these challenges and all of these issues, I do want to also stop and thank people that have really made this possible. Well, since we launched the MA in 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 2017, but um, even even this year under these circumstances, um, and there's so many people, of course, that have helped us really to survive. Uh, first of all, I want to thank our our, our community of, of heritage sector partners that have provided students with placements, remote placements, uh, uh, even this year, and given incredible opportunities to our students uh, and all kinds of other partners at museums and archives and heritage locations around London and the UK that have been supportive of us as long as we've been us. Um, I want to thank my colleagues in the history department um, and to our well new head of department since since the last uh, uh, the last annual lecture, um, Professor Richard Grayson, who's who's been a steadfast champion um, for the MA Queer History program since taking up his post. Um, I especially want to thank our department's professional staff. They they make the world turn. This 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 none of this would be happening without all of the incredible work they do under under normal circumstances, let alone under these ones. And and I especially want to acknowledge all of the work that's done by by Novenka Martin, Daniel Fraser, and Paula Tarides um, to 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 support us in in so many ways above and beyond. Um, Daniel has 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 left us this year after well after being the post grad coordinator ever since I started and being just such an incredible stalwart supporter uh, and and doing so much work to help the uh, the program thrive and continue. And Daniel's gone on to pursue his own PhD. So our our congratulations and best luck to uh, to Daniel um, in in that. And finally, I also want to thank Benno, our speaker uh, tonight. Um, Benno joined very shortly after I did and has been at the very origins of the MA Queer History program. Um, and really his mark will be left on the program, uh, uh, well, now that he's gone and for many years uh, to continue. Um, his, his influence on the foundation of the program and how it's continued and its, its successes uh, cannot be underestimated. So it's absolutely a delight and an honor to welcome uh, Benno back to Goldsmiths, even if virtually, even if we can't have our bubbly reception and uh, toast you with drinks, I'm absolutely delighted that we can we can we can welcome you virtually now and celebrate the publication of your book, celebrate the uh, 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 the, the the success of your work and your new appointment uh, in Florence. And with that, I'd like to hand proceedings over to the president of the Goldsmiths History Society, um, Holly Cooper, who will introduce Benno. Hi, everyone. So, yeah, that was a brilliant, um, shining introduction for Benno. And you have to hear me talk for a few minutes before we head over to him. But I just want to introduce myself um, as the president of History Society at Goldsmiths um, since the uh, winter term. Um, I am the part of the first cohort of MA Black British History at Goldsmiths and like queer history we are doing some very um, interesting stuff. We are really sort of um, creating a space at Goldsmiths where our sort of um, understanding and our sort of academia can, uh, can thrive. So um, yeah the society has really taken off this year, um, this being our actual third formal um, talk that's fully open and accessible to the public. Um, our first one being held by Justin, uh, who just gave us a brilliant introduction then of the talk. Um, we've also had Dr. Tom Bishop, um, and our next talk is actually held by a current PhD student at Goldsmiths, um, a previous graduate of MA Queer History. Um, so please keep an eye out for that. It should be really interesting. Um, so yeah, I just sort of wanted to talk a bit about what we've done this year as a society. So. We have made it very clear uh, our stance on the industrial action happening at Goldsmiths at the moment. For those of you who aren't aware, um, there is industrial action happening at the university and we really, we're backing our staff and our professional staff and Mavenka and Daniel, who is now doing his PhD, all such um, pillar stones of our learning at the university. Um, and also Benno is included in that um, for his short stay for um, MA Queer History. Um, he, Benno is currently um, holding the chair for the history of gender and sexuality at the European Institute, um, University Institute. Um, he's currently in Florence, so um, I'll, I'll pretend that I'm not incredibly jealous of him right now. Um, so Benno's um, uh, sort of um, 
field of expertise is homosexuality in uh, modern Germany. His um, first book, which is he is well, his book that he's releasing at the moment, uh, the English title of which is um, Feeling Differently, Gay and Lesbian Life in the Federal Republic of Germany, A History of Emotions, um, which is a book that contains the first comprehensive history of homosexuality in the Federal Republic of Germany. Uh, with a detailed look into the emotional lives of same-sex lovers since the 1950s, um, allowing women and men of different generations to have their say. Um, and this is obviously the inspiration for tonight's talk. And um, so I, I will hand over to uh, Dr. Benno Gamerl. Thank you very much, um, Holly, for um, the kind and very generous introduction. Thanks, Justin. Thanks for the invitation. It's, it's a great pleasure to be back after all those weeks. Um, and uh, I mean, it is, you know, I don't know whether I should say that after kind of, you know, having been part of this endeavor and kind of having had the honor to um, bring the Center for Queer History to, to support that work um, for um, a couple of years. But I really think um, it is a great opportunity to celebrate the success of this center as well and the MA Queer History program. I think it already left its mark on the academic landscape. Um, it's fair to say that. And I think, um, um, you know, it, it makes a difference also in a political sense. So, you know, I mean, if this annual lecture is good for anything, it's good for celebrating exactly that. Um, so I, I just wanted, wanted to say that for starters. Um, it is really wonderful to be back, um, but of course, it's, it's, um, I'm back in difficult times. Holly already mentioned the industrial action. Um, and as a former student and a former lecturer at Goldsmiths, I wholeheartedly support staff, students, and all the other groups who protest against the plan to evolve, restructure, and impoverish the college. I really hope that this struggle um, will be successful and that the kind of, you know, more inspiring visions dedicated to the community's unruly potential, to Goldsmith's unruly potential, will carry the day in the end. Um, and, and, and kind of to, to um, you know, um, make this support visible, um, I thought I could follow in the footsteps of the Goldsmith's History Society's very own um, hashtag, uh, Cutting Corners. Um, I don't know whether you're familiar with that. If not, check it out. Um, and therefore, I have included a Francis um, in my talk, um, who can also be considered as being superior to Goldsmith's current warden. That's kind of the, the, the threat, the, the hashtag, what, what it's all about. Um, and the point is that, you know, within the next 25 minutes or so, whenever you hear me saying Francis, you may, if you want to, you may use this moment um, to vent whatever opinion you may have in a solitary and solidary moment of online protest. Um, but with that, I will now go to um, queer history in Germany. And I don't know whether we already did or whether we can share um, the slides. Um, that's, that's where it all begins. Good times and also very bad ones. Queer history in modern Germany. Um, and you'll, you'll see what I'll try to do um, under that title. This is the first presentation, actually. It's the it's, it's, it's first one moment for me as well. First presentation of a new project, a short queer history of modern Germany, um, which obviously expands on my most recent book that um, Holly has mentioned on homosexualities and emotional life in West Germany since the 1950s. So now kind of I'm going larger and looking at the complete 20th century. I'm very, I'm really very happy to present and discuss this, these first ideas exactly here because the whole project very much builds on um, the year two and three uh, module, which is called Queer Man or Queer Man, which, whichever way um, you prefer, um, which I had the pleasure um, to um, create and to teach twice at Goldsmiths actually before I left. And this gave me the invaluable opportunity to discuss crucial questions with students and to read their essays, what they thought and had found about the topic about um, modern queer history in Germany. So um, I would also like to use this opportunity to thank um, students a lot for that. What follows is actually the result of a collaborative intellectual endeavor. But of course, if there are any flaws, these are totally mine. Right, um, and in that respect, I also really look forward to the Q and A, uh, and look forward to your questions and your comments at the end of the talk. 
I have never been fond of linear narratives, let alone teleological stories of success. The history of gay liberation, of growing societal acceptance of sexual diversity is often told in such a fashion as a story of success. But even at the most superficial level, German queer history shows that there was no continuous progress from a dark past of oppression to a bright present of freedom. So German queer history may be uh, you know, particularly um, apt to show how that kind of idea of a continuous success story is um, flawed. Here now begins my very, very, very short crash course in German history and German queer history in the long 20th century. Um, that is from 1871 to 2021, just in case anybody um, is not totally aware of that already. So kind of the first phase in kind of a classical um, chronological narrative would be Imperial Germany between 1871 and 1918. Here we look at the persecution of bi and homosexual men, particularly under the paragraph 175, um, which some of you might have heard of, um, that criminalized male homosexuality. But we also look at the first organizations that work towards decriminalization in uh, the time of Imperial Germany. And one interesting um, aspect of um, um, this period is a quite famous court and media scandal um, the harden eulenburg affair, um, which happened in 1907 um, to 1909. And it's so um, particularly important because it involved members of the nobility who were very close to the Emperor William Wilhelm II. And it is in this kind of a couple of court cases and media coverage, of course, it is in this context that knowledge about homosexuality began to circulate widely. And that's why I brought you this postcard. It was um, sent in 1912. It's a postcard about the, um, the, the Harden trial. Um, and it shows different social scenes. So you see um, two kind of noble men um, two aristocrats, and the one is saying, look, isn't there a guy with white pants and long shafted boots um, who's just walking around the corners, who's, which is kind of alluding to the fact that noblemen would often have sex with soldiers, often also for money. So that is kind of one scene on that. Uh, another scene on the, on the middle left-hand side of the postcard, a gentleman is telling his friend and then his servant, I don't know, since the Harden case, I feel an urge to go to the south. John, will you please pack my suitcases? And that scene obviously um, alludes to the fact that many kind of um, well-off, same-sex desiring men who could afford it would escape to the Mediterranean, particularly to Italy, where I'm right now. Um, and then at the very bottom, where you see the two laborers, one drinking beer, um, and that dialogue goes, it's difficult to translate. In the original, it says, Prost tutti liebchen. Uh, so you could translate it as cheers, darling. And the other um, um, guy says, blame me, when's the new manners? So it's kind of, I would read that as saying, oh my God, kind of the, the, these kind of middle class homosexual codes um, are now already kind of known by the working classes. So kind of the postcard shows you how kind of knowledge about homosexuality and different um, patterns of same-sex desire really um, was already widely circulating in the public sphere in imperial times. Then, of course, after the First World War, we move into Weimar Germany, 1918 to 1933, um, where there is a growing subculture with organizations, magazines, and entertainment spaces for same-sex loving men, women, and trans people. Here you see the Damen Club Violetta, the, the Ladies Club Violetta. It's a picture from around 1930, um, which was a space for same-sex loving and cross-dressing women. After that, Nazi Germany, um, from 1933 to 1945. Um, here you see the destruction of Magnus Hirschfeld Institute for Sexual Science, an, an institute um, that was very successful in Weimar times in disseminating um, knowledge about sex and sexuality, but also in, in promoting more liberal attitudes towards sexual diversity and gender diversity. Um, it was one of the first things the Nazis did after they came to power in, in May 1933. Um, um, they destroyed this very institute, which was known as a space and a hub for information on all things queer, and now um, it was destroyed by the Nazis. 
And soon after that, um, the Nazis also intensified persecution um, of same-sex desiring men. Between 5,000 and 15,000 of them were sent to concentration camps. So that is, um, in a nutshell, what happened in the Nazi period. Then, after the Second World War, post-war East and West Germany, between 1945 and 1990, um, First of all, in the 50s and 60s, there is continued stigmatization and prosecution of, of same-sex desiring men um, and, and lesbian women. But then in the 1970s, there's a moment of radical gay and lesbian feminist movements, the, that um, emancipatory movement in the West, but also in the East. That's why I brought here a picture from East Berlin, um, a protest um, that involved the Homosexuelle Interessengemeinschaft Berlin, the HIB, Homosexual Organization in East Berlin, and also involved Peter Tatchell. Um, 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 and that is during the World Youth Games in East Berlin in 1973, they organized that um, homosexual liberation manifestation, um, which kind of the sign was up long enough for that picture to be taken, but not much longer. But there is these, these emancipatory groups um, on both sides of the wall in the 1970s. And after that, of course, um, contemporary Germany since 1990, um, where you have a growing or we see a growing acceptance of sexual diversity and normalization of homosexuality, large LGBT rights organizations like the LSVD, the um, Lesben Schwulenverband Deutschland, the biggest um, um, gay and lesbian um, rights organization, civil rights organization in Germany, um, and how they promote, among other things, the acceptance of rainbow families. That's what you see here. So kind of more and more an image of um, acceptance of sexual diversity and normalization of homosexuality. So that was the short crash course. But even in this most traditional chronological order, it becomes clear that there is no unidirectional progress. In Imperial Germany, same-sex desiring men were persecuted. Activists began challenging this criminalization already before 1900, yet their efforts remained futile. But tolerance and visibility increased, especially in Weimar times, with organizations and magazines catering to gay, lesbian, and transvestite audiences. This subculture was then systematically destroyed by the Nazis. 1933 witnessed a sudden shift from emerging acceptance to ruthless repression. This basically continued after 1945 in West Germany more so than in East Germany. It is only with partial decriminalization around 1970 and the gay and the lesbian feminist emancipation movements that things begin to change for the better again. Normalization gained ground from the 1980s onwards. Same-sex love, once entirely stigmatized, was now more and more integrated into a broadening spectrum of sexual options. The introduction of marriage for all in 2017 continued this dynamic. So, and that's kind of already obvious now, it is not a story of linear improvement, but rather a hiccup history with ups and downs good times and also very bad ones. Yet I think one should complicate the temporality of the queer history of modern Germany further. Um, and there is several ways of doing that. One might be to look at contingent ruptures and discontinuous leaps. And I would be thrilled if anybody wants to share um, ideas along those lines um, in the Q&A. Another possibility is to show that contradictory dynamics can actually coexist and did in fact coexist. So historical periods are not always clearly defined either by oppression, kind of bad times, or liberation, good times. Contradictory dynamics can and in fact do coexist. And I think that's really important to look at that as well. How kind of, you know, kind of we cannot neatly separate out different historical phases into more oppressive and more liberatory ones. Yet today I want to focus on complicating the modern history of queer Germany by looking at how memories, hauntings, and other recurrences fold different times into one another. So I want to look at memory. Do you remember, I want to query, as do you remember as Helen pointingly asked David in Aunt Fanny's, a.k.a. Francis, Elizabeth Barrow's book, The Wife's Stratagem, from 1862. 
So that's my question for, for today. Do you remember? What do we remember and how do we remember it? Or in other words, how have representations of the past and the retrospectatorship of activists, historians and others shaped the course of queer things in modern Germany? Let's begin with what can be considered the most obvious turning point, 1969. Stonewall, of course, but not many people in Germany perceived of these riots as a decisive watershed at the time. Far more crucial for West Germany was the decriminalization of sex between consenting adult men in the same year, 1969, and the fact that Willy Brandt, Willy Brandt took office as the first social democratic chancellor of the Federal Republic also in this year, 1969. Both events indicated broader shifts in politics and society, among them a more relaxed attitude towards questions of sexual morale. So kind of there's a, a broader liberal, liberalization process underway. Simultaneously, the student and other protest movements of the late 1960s triggered the emergence of new gay and lesbian feminist emancipatory endeavors. It is in this context that we see how crucial memory could be for shaping activism. Out of the caves. Um, that's, that's the sign you see here. Um, what you see on the image is the first gay demonstration in West Germany um, in Munster, Westphalia, um, of all places, in 1972. Um, and uh, the sign you see in the center of um, the image, it says, Homos raus aus den Löchern, which roughly translates as um, homosexuals leave the caves, out of the caves. Um, the new radical and emancipatory movement took to the street, took to the streets, as you can see here, and requested the older homosexuals who were allegedly hiding in the caves, meaning in the private sphere, in homophile bars, and in public toilets and other cruising areas, to come out into the open. Um, so that was kind of the challenge um, that the new emancipatory movement um, formulated. The radical gays and lesbians of the 1970s thus distanced themselves from the inconspicuous lives same-sex desiring people had led in the post-war decades. And there is already kind of a moment of memory, kind of how um, the pre-1970 times were commemorated because they were construed as shaped by fear and by hiding. Um, and this memory supported the um, radical emancipatory movement self-image as courageous and provocatively open. So they were shouting out radical political demands while their predecessors pre-1970 were remember, remembered as timid. And this was of course also staged as a generational conflict. The bleaker the pre-1970s were imagined, the brighter could the new age shine. So that's the first moment of, of, of memory. Um, then the next past that came to bear on the present of the 1970s was the Nazi period. Memory of the persecution of homosexuals between 1933 and 1945 gained prominence from the mid to late 1970s onwards with AIDS activism lending renewed importance to exactly that kind of memory commemoration of the Nazi past. The pink triangle that homosexual inmates in the concentration camps had to wear comes to be, in exactly that period, a central symbol. And here you see it in the image, so it's, it's kind of um, the pink triangle um, that is kind of standing, um, you know, that's exactly um, in, 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 in the format it, it, it um, would have been used in the concentration camps. Um, and here you can see it um, as a sign used in, in an AIDS protest in Munich in 1987. Um, the slogan written on it um, is Kondome statt Gauweiler Progrome, um, condoms instead of Gauweiler pogroms. Um, and Peter Gauweiler back then in the 1980s was a conservative polit politician, infamous for kind of his suggestions how to best deal with the AIDS um, pandemic. Um, one of his suggestions was to put HIV positive people into, into internment camps. So there you can cl quite clearly see um, the historical commemorative connection from that kind of political moment back to the Nazi past. But there is also kind of um, beyond demonstrations, 
um, um, memorials come up commemorating Nazi persecution. Um, this is one of the first ones um, at Neulendorfplatz in um, Berlin, which was erected in 1989. And as many of those, again, you see the triangle um, um, and, and kind of you see several of those monuments across Germany and kind of um, um, many of them read exactly like this one, totgeschlagen, totgeschwiegen, beaten to death, killed um, by silence to the homosexual victims of national socialism. Right, so that is kind of the more official version of commemorating the Nazi past. And then of course the most um, official version um, is um, the um, um, monument built by the Federal Republic, by the government of the Federal Republic of Germany, um, built in 2008, which you see here in Berlin in the Tiergarten, the memorial for the homosexuals persecuted under national socialism. And here again, the link between history, memory and politics is made explicit. There is kind of a little sign next to that monument and it reads, quote, with this memorial, the Federal Republic of Germany intends to honor the victims to keep alive the memory of this injustice and to create a lasting symbol of opposition to enmity, intolerance, and the exclusion of gay men and lesbians." End quote. I will only mention in passing, though, though this is really interesting, um, the um, long and ongoing conflicts about whether and how lesbians um, um, should be included in this memory, and um, in the quote they are included. And of course the other question is, uh, what about trans people? which are here not mentioned or maybe not yet mentioned. Um, so, uh, I mean, here you really see how commemoration generates real and powerful political effects and how there is also kind of a competition about who can be um, part of that commemoration because being commemorated as a, a group victimized by the Nazis comes with a certain kind of recognition um, and this, exactly this recognition has been denied to LGBT people for a long time after um, the Second World War. Um, but now, finally, kind of this, this recognition is avoided and it comes with a certain esteem. It enables one to claim compensation. So you can also make um, financial uh, uh, demands based on this. And it comes with media attention, right? So there you can see kind of the political um, significance of all this, this kind of um, commemorative policies. And then there is a third wave of memory that gains momentum in the 80s, late 80s, and that commemorates the early homosexual rights movement and the subculture of the 1920s. In um, 1982, the Magnus Hirschfeld Society was founded in West Berlin to further research on the work of, of this sexologist uh, um, who founded the Institute for um, Sexual Science and his fellow scientists and activists. So that's one kind of endeavor that is dedicated to this specific memory of the 20s and the early homosexual rights activism. In 1984, West Berlin saw the El Dorado exhibition, which looked actually at the history of homosexualities from 1850 to 1950, but not coincidentally, it chose as its title the name of famous nightlife spaces for same-sex desiring and gender non-conforming people in 1920s Berlin. And that's the place you see here, the Eldorado um, in, a, in a, a photograph from 1932 the Eldorado in, in, in Berlin. So this is kind of commemorating the 20s. Um, and the, commemorating the 20s as a roaring time, right? Kind of um, when there was a large scale visibility of um, same sex desiring and gender non-conforming people. Um, and then also memory of the first homosexual um, um, emancipation movement. This is another memorial um, that was opened in 2017. Um, commemorating the homosexual rights activism that was going on in Imperial and Weimar Germany. Um, and interestingly, it's not just a memorial, it's also kind of this feeds into um, Berlin's city marketing. Um, in, in, the, in the 2020s, um, Berlin's city marketing also tried to cash in on the reputation of the 1920s in order to attract queer tourists to Berlin. So, I mean, you know, once we can travel again, then we might follow that attraction and travel to Berlin. Um, but just to give you a quote from um, the Visit Berlin campaign from their website, quote, back in the 1920s, Berlin had already become a haven and refuge for gays and lesbians from all over the world. 
And um, they not only make that claim, but they also highlight Berlin as a place where the first homosexual rights organization, the Scientific Humanitarian Committee, was founded in 1897. And they do so with this image, which I, I find that image so funny, right? I mean, I mean, not only are these guys that are here supposedly depicted um, thinking about and looking at the space where um, the Scientific Humanitarian Committee was founded in 1897s, you know, they, first of all, they are much more sleeveless than their supposed forerunners from the late 1970, uh, 19th century would ever have been at any point in, in, in their lives, right? I mean, you see kind of the historical distance um, in, in, in that picture. And then, I, I mean, not only sleeveless, uh, they also seem to be clueless. I mean, it's difficult to tell. They are obviously supposed to perform you know, looking back at queer history, um, they might be looking um, at the, um, um, the, 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 the column, um, which is mentioned in the text right next to the image, the column erected opposite Charlottenburg Town Hall that serves as a memorial to the uh, historical birthplace of the Scientific Humanitarian Committee. Um, but you see kind of the whole complexity of how different times fold into one another in this specific um, image that is used to market Berlin as a queer tourist destination. So where does all this leave us, this quick tour through the history and the politics of queer memory in Germany? Is queer memory evolving in loops that concentrically circle around the focal point of 1969 or kind of around 1970? First, that's kind of what we've done so far, right? First, activists in the 1970s remembered the immediate past as a particularly bad time. Later on, the Nazi period came into view as an even worse period. And finally, the memory of the 1920s, a happier era, gained currency. So the further emancipatory movements and normalizing dynamics moved towards a presumably brighter future, the further back they reached in their commemorative practices to undergird their self-understanding by distancing or identifying with certain groups from the past or to support their political claims with historical arguments. But does this then once more highlight the time zone around 1970 as a hinge, as a decisive turning point around which queer memory evolves? Queer history, especially in Western countries, has long considered it a decisive turning point, this kind of time around 1970, when the switches were worked that allowed things to move from oppression to liberation. Do the dynamics of queer memory ultimately also circle around this moment and just once more highlight exactly this kind of narrative that highlights the moment around 1970 as decisive? I would say not really. Once one starts to trace the dynamics of queer memory, one also finds folds and links and circles and loops that follow different patterns. And this becomes most clear, first of all, when we look at the history and memory of trans people, um, because um, then we um, trace quite different trajectories. Here um, um, you see a magazine, kind of it's, it's a re-edition of a, a, a magazine um, from the early 1930s that catered to um, a cross-dressing transvestite audience and that um, kind of was published in five issues between 1930 and 1932. Um, so there is also, there might be kind of a late interwar period or late Weimar period moment where trans history can kind of could look for identification, right? As those young guys did um, when they um, visit Berlin. Um, but it's, it's much more complicated in this case because this magazine called Das Dritte Geschlecht, uh, the third gender or the third sex, um, it, it does not serve well as an identificatory point of reference because first of all, it had a strong, really strong middle-class bias. And then um, it was primarily catering to readers who self-identified as heterosexual cross-dresses. So from a contemporary kind of trans point of view, this is not an ideal kind of identificatory opportunity. Equally complicated is the commemoration of trans experiences in the Nazi period. I briefly mentioned when I, when I talked about the memorial for the um, homosexual victims that trans people are not included there. Gender non-conforming people were certainly subject to persecution and victimization in the Nazi period. 
But kind of, I would say, further research needs to be done to better understand the overall situation of trans and gender ambiguous people in, in, in Nazi times. So again, here, things are, are more complicated um, or um, at the moment still too complicated to, to make any kind of clear historically based claims based on, on victimhood, for example. And then um, there is also an, another difference when we look at trans history. Um, where 1980, at least for Germany, seems to be a much more important date than 1969 or 1970. In 1980 and 81, the law on transsexuality, as it is called, came into force in West Germany. And in that very debate about that law and in the struggle, ongoing struggle against this law, trans activism gained more prominence in Germany. Um, therefore, this book, which you say here, which, which has been edited by the Berlin Senate, um, and looks at the, the lives of trans people um, between 1945 and 1980. That's exactly the reason why this book um, um, chooses 1980 as an end point, because it is around 1980 that things um, begin to shift and the situation of trans people changes significantly. So again, a completely different um, trajectory um, and trans history and memory follow different dynamics um, than um, the ones that we've so far looked at that always circle around the moment around 1970. Just um, two more other kind of commemorative links that I find interesting to look at and that kind of further complicate things. Um, one is the post-war memory of the Nazi period. That's really an interesting one, right? Because, I mean, from the 1970s, you have that memory of the pink triangle and homosexual men sent to the concentration camps. In the immediate, kind of in the 1950s, immediately after the Nazi period, um, in the homophile magazines I looked at, the memory of the Nazi period is much more complicated. It's not all negative. I mean, you, you can believe me, not all homophile men in West Germany were staunch, staunch anti-fascists. You find a lot of kind of um, kind of cherished moments of looking back at moments of camaraderie in the war and in the Nazi organizations. And you also find kind of, you know, uh, kind of Nazi thinking and, um, and ideology also um, in parts continues into the post-war period. So not everybody um, right away highlighted persecution and oppression. There was also voices that praised the potential um, for homosocial camaraderie in the Nazi period, um, which is kind of a weird kind of commemorative link. Um, and then there is um, another, I think, very interesting kind of moment is when the 50s and 60s are revisited. So at first I, I said kind of in the 1970s, the radical gay lesbian feminist activists, they thought of the 50s and 60s as, as a time of timidity, right? Where their predecessors did not dare to take to the streets, to come out, to be loud and to make um, provocative claims. Um, but now in the last 10 years or so, um, the 50s and 60s are kind of revisited in a different way. They are now looked at as a period of, of victimization um, on, and of severe persecution, especially in the West German context. Um, and that, of course, also has to do um, with um, kind of one example for that is this um, 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 project that you see here that has been focusing on the southwestern German state of Baden-Württemberg. Um, and included um, the 50s and 60s in their research um, and shows how they were seriously victimized. Um, and this again is closely intertwined again with the Bundestag decision, uh, a German parliamentary decision from 2017, because it was then that the parliament decided finally to pay compensation to people who have been sentenced under paragraph 175 after 1940. Um, five. So in um, um, uh, um, decades of the, in, in the time of the Federal Republic of Germany. So it is here again, you see that clear link between a specific kind of memory and a financial claim um, that is of course also a political claim. So here we have yet another commemorative link that follows a different pattern. And with that, it's high time that I come to the end Taking all this together, I think one can write a queer history of modern Germany focusing on the complicated temporalities of memory and thus avoiding a linear narrative of progress or a hiccup history of ups and downs. Mind you, I'm not saying that these other versions of the story are completely wrong. They are not. I'm just saying that they alone do not suffice if one wants to tell a queer history that grows up to the complexity and the intriguing nature of the matter.
And I think this complexity is also important for political reasons, and that's, that's what I want to conclude with. Contemporary queer activism is facing a contradictory situation where there is ongoing stigmatization and at the same time ongoing normalization. That's what I said in the beginning, right? It's not so easy to draw a clear line between oppression and liberation. I think at the moment we have both things happening at the same time. Some situations continue to be bad, others get better, while such improvements can also generate new problems and challenges. Hence, queer activism should devise different strategies, a variety of strategies to effectively address these diverse problems and to organize solidarity between various parts of the queer spectrum ones kind of you know benefiting from norm normalizations as well as the ones who are um, in less privileged positions and i think queer history can help with that with kind of coming up with that variety of strategies by remembering the good times and also the very bad ones thank you very much um, and now i look forward to the discussion wow <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, Benno. That was that was really, really, really interesting and really surprisingly very thorough considering you only took, you know, 40 minutes. So brilliant. Thank you. And it's also got such a um, positive response in the chat. There are lots and lots of questions um, to ask, but I'm going to open with one that closely resonates to my own question I wanted to ask you um, and my own research in the sort of idea of reclaiming um, our histories. So um, the question is from G. Willett, um, 1956. And the question is, do we know when and how the pink triangle came to be revived as a moralizing object in the 1970s? Um, hi, Graham. Um, thanks for the question. Um, I'm obviously, kind of the person to ask this question would be Sebastien, Sebastien Tremblay, who, who's kind of doing fantastic stuff on the history of the pink triangle. Um, so I'm, you know, I can't, I can't say more that about the when, that it is in the 1970s. It is quite early on. Um, uh, Sebastian is actually here, so he might kind of have the answer ready in the chat. Um, um, it's very early on in, in, in kind of 1970s activism um, that uh, the pink triangle is used um, on stickers um, and used as a, a, a symbol to signify um, also gay identity. Um, but um, yeah, I think that's all I can say about this one. Great question, but um, yeah. Thanks, Benno. I just want to uh, echo Holly's thanks for the talk and to uh, yeah express all of the enthusiasm too that I'm seeing in the um, in the chat and in the questions. There was already as your talk was ongoing a lot of uh, good wishes and love from students and colleagues. So you'll have to go back and scroll through everything when you. <clears throat> When you when you get the chance and uh, and I saw in in some staff uh, chat groups some some uh, some excitement to see you again so I pass on those <laughs> um, there have been yeah all kinds of questions I'm going to actually I'm going to go right into into those because of course I can bend your ear in my own time but uh, there's some really great questions um, that are uh, that are coming out here one of them quite early on uh, I think uh, asking maybe your earlier parts of your paper is asking about some context about the hardened affair and the impact that this had on public attitudes to homosexuality in Imperial Germany and how that might compare, um, uh, depending on your familiarity with earlier British queer history, um, with the Cleveland Street scandal in Imperial Britain. Um, well, in terms of the outcome, um, there was quite a lot of um, hope in the harden oilenburg affair and in the court case. Magnus Hirschfeld was also, he was testifying in court. Um, in one of the cases, in one of the trials. And his hope, of course, would was that kind of it would be an opportunity to circulate kind of more accepting understandings of same-sex desire and to explain to a broader public how it's all not sinful and uh, about illness, but it's just a normal variation um, of, of sexuality. Um, but then kind of probably most historians would say that actually it backfired. Um, Hirschfeld also kind of had to withdraw, had to change his expertise, his, the statement he had done in, in the trial. And, and so it's, I mean, it's definitely both things at the same time. So there is kind of more, um, 
accepting knowledge about um, um, homosexuality that begins to circulate in the context of that news coverage, but there is also kind of homophobia um, and, um, you know, kind of all, all this kind of, it, it is kind of same-sex desire from the very beginning in this case is used as a slander against a very specific um, political group um, in, in, in Germany. So you have, yeah, good, good and bad effects if you, if you want, um, at the same time again in this case. Um, and, and, I, and I think you can say a very similar, you, uh, in that respect, it, I think it is similar to um, the, the Cleveland Street example, right? That um, um, there is kind of knowledge about same-sex desire circulating more broadly, and that always has ambivalent effects, right? So um, maybe in that, and, and then kind of the next question one would have to discuss in more detail is um, how one would read it in terms of class. Um, um, the Harden um, Eulenburg affair also had kind of, it, it went through all classes in terms of whom it involved, the high nobility, the middle classes, but there were also some kind of working class people who at, at some later stage of the affair kind of came into the picture. So in that respect, it's also most interesting to read it in terms of class. But I think I, I leave it at that for the time being, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, that definitely. I think you sort of covered it quite well, actually. Um, so were there any significant differences in the attitudes surrounding queer acceptance slash liberation between East Germany and West Germany? And that question comes from Amanda or Mandy Wall. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, difficult and hence great question. Um, um, the, um, well, the, the, the main difference would be kind of that both movements happen in very different political systems and conditions, um, especially when looking at the av availability of media channels to inform other people and to, um, you know, you know, just circulate that uh, time of the next group meeting um, or circulating thoughts and articles. So such a public sphere where you could just come on up with your own little um, gay or lesbian newspaper did not exist um, in East Germany. And of course, everything that was printed was tightly controlled by the state. Um, that um, the HIB could actually um, happen, emerge in the 1970s in East Berlin was due to kind of a short moment of opening up um, that 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 format of the Interessengemeinschaft was actually thought by um, um, the GDR um, government for you know people who would uh, have gardens somewhere or would would you know kind of a neighborhood kind of initiative. Um, they didn't think of, of homosexual groups, right? And whenever kind of um, gays and lesbians as a group came to be visible in public and um, um, formulated the political demands as a group, um, then kind of quite quickly um, um, things were shut down and uh, the HIB also um, um, discontinued their work. They came back then later in the 1980s. So the, in that respect, of course, the situation was um, much more difficult in, in, in East Germany, where in West Germany there are several um, emancipatory groups, um, several um, um, self-organized newspapers and magazines, a plethora of spaces, feminist bookshops, you know, what have you, um, subcultural entertainment spaces, all that did not exist to the same extent in East Germany. All the more remarkable it is that such a protest happened already in the 1970s in, in, in East Germany. So yeah, definitely important to highlight the differences um, between the East and the West German um, situation there as well. Thanks, Benno. The, the The next question actually comes from well, it's the first question from one of our uh, one of our students. Uh, so uh, a uh, someone familiar to you from Goldsmith, Julia Shaw. Um, Julia is is following up on your comments about Stonewall not being not really being perceived in Germany and asking if you can unpack this a bit. Um, and she she continues, as I understand, the first German uh, Christopher Street Day uh, parade was in 1972 in Münster, um, but big cities had it much later. Why why is this? Ah, ah. Um, the, 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 it was actually um, the, the gay demonstration in Münster in 1972 was called Schwulen Demo. Um, interestingly, lesbians were also part of that, but kind of that's um, not long after kind of the gay and the lesbian um, movements 
went more separate um, paths. So this was not a Christopher Street Day. Um, the, the first time that um, parades or demonstrations, rather demonstrations, um, used the name Christopher Street Day is in 1979. Um, Bremen, um, West Berlin, um, th that's where kind of this, this label starts being used. So Christopher Street, as she explained that, refers to the Stonewall Inn. So that's kind of the reference to the Stonewall Rise of 1969 in, in New York. And um, um, it, that it, it kind of enters German vocabulary of gay activism in the late 70s has to do with a film, um, a, a film by Rosa von Braunheim about, um, it's called Armee der Liebenden, which is basically about the gay and lesbian movement in the US. And that kind of screened um, in the late 1970s and that brought kind of all that story and also the myth of Stonewall um, kind of to, to a German gay and lesbian activist public. Um, in, in the, at the time itself, the late 60s and early 70s, it was not so, I mean, people read about it, knew it, but it was not necessarily um, immediately perceived as the one thing that, and, and of course, it's, it is not the one thing that changed the world, right? I mean, um, as several researchers have shown that that story and that myth kind of is worth kind of being interrogated. Um, but in, if, from a German perspective, it's really other things were more important. Decriminalization, as I said, but then also a film that came out in the early 1970s um, called Nicht der Homosexuelle ist pervers. It's not the homosexual who's perverse, but the situation in which he lives. And that kind of screenings of that film often um, were followed by kind of first initiatives to found um, and to run homosexual emancipation groups. So it's it's kind of, it took a while in Germany until kind of um, um, the message, um, the story of Stonewall um, was publicly acknowledged. And then also kind of um, gay pride parades began to be called Christopher Street Days in Germany in the late seventies. Yeah, brilliant. That's great. Um, so the next question comes from Jenevans, who actually has lots of brilliant questions um, in the chat. But the first one is about the normative memory in Berlin, in the Berlin Mon Monument, and, and how does it serve a particular political consensus today around toleration? Um, if that... Um, yeah, ab absolutely. Um, that's 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 kind of the idea, and that's it's kind of written into the monument. It's part of the parliamentary decision to erect the monument. Is that text um, that um, asks all of us to um, consider it as a sign, a lasting sign for promoting tolerance? Um, and then, I mean, I mean that kind of word in itself is interesting to think about but um, what is also interesting to think about is i don't know who has seen um, the memorial so it is you, you, you look into it and inside there's a film on display and kind of it's now the third version of this film so it started with man kissing then kind of um it was male male and female female couples kissing in, in, in the second film now the film um that is currently on display um has kind of brings in um diversity on several levels also gender non-conformity gender non-binary people um and it's more historical because in the background you see actually you see the slideshow that i shared uh, with you today you see kind of famous um, images and posters and what have you um, from german queer history while kind of all kinds of couples are kissing um, um, um in front of that background so so kind of the films in the monument get more and more inclusive in terms of the kinds of diversity um, they display. But then what I also find most interesting in that respect, talking about what that monument signifies, um, it is um, not often, but it is attacked, kind of it is um, destroyed, you know, people kind of um, put color or in whatever way kind of um, voice their homophobic attitudes as well and their transphobic attitudes um, around that monument. And some people argue that th that is actually where it is at its strongest because it makes visible the ongoing issue um, to fight and to struggle against homo and transphobia. Um, and I kind of like that reading, right? Because, um, in that sense, it is um, a living monument 
um, that actually do does remind us um, of something that is happening today, not only of something that has happened in the past. Thanks, Ben. You're actually anticipating some of the questions uh, uh, coming up in a really useful way. Um, and uh, we've got a, a couple comments. I mean, from someone who's already been named tonight, uh, Sébastien Tremblay, uh, was asking about the visual specifically, um, which you, you've, you've, you've uh, 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 nodded to just now in your answer. But I was going to focus on uh, Sébastien's first question. Uh, uh, and, and he asked, what about the tension between haunting temporalities and memory? Can we really think about memory if we talk about past of injury, uh, sorry, a past of injury haunting the present instead of utopia future also being at stake? Um, no, oh God, okay, I, I got the bit about the difference between haunting and memory. Um, um, and the turn towards the future and the, I'll try, I'll try as far as I get. Um, absolutely. One, one thing um, I would say here is um, the difference between individual memory and cultural memory. And that's kind of a very obvious way to react to that. Um, I'm not sure whether I would use um, the word trauma, but if you think about somebody who's um, remembering um, their own victimization, right? I think um, then um, the term haunting is more um, appropriate. Um, and then, of course, I also think about that in terms of the oral history research I did. Um, and there you, you actually, you, you, you can see that kind of haunting because people, um, when invited to tell their life stories and given the space to do so, um, you know, kind of over hours, um, there is things that are recurrent and that kind of return, although kind of they are not necessarily, um, appropriate or, or no, appropriate is the wrong word, although they do not necessarily blend in easily with um, the narrative that is told, right? So there, there we have these, these kinds of things that come back. Um, for example, um, in one of the live narratives I recorded about the disgust um, that, that this narrator um, experienced as a young man when he for the first time saw um, um, two men kissing. And that kind of, in all kinds of different situations, this kind of returns um, in, in, in his biographical narrative. Um, so um, that is still about memory, but there you have more of that haunting, that kind of involuntary or, or kind of, you know, kind of, uh, I mean, the ghosts that haunt you, you know, you, haven't, you hadn't invited them. Um, the more official um, a memory is, the more it is, of course, invited. Um, but I think the two, can be and often are linked to one another. And how that then opens up, I, I think now I understand, so it's kind of now I have to talk about Derrida and, and how that opens up to the future. Um, but I think it's exactly through that um, mechanism of the unexpected. That's, that, that's what I would say here. So kind of things that return unexpectedly um, and that, um, Kind of make you say something that you did not want to say, um, and that so you say something that's new to yourself, um, and that opens opens up fresh possibilities. So that's probably how I would construe it. I'm more um, confident doing that, talking about individual memory, individual haunting moments that keep coming back. Um, kind of translating that to uh, kind of a collective level, a societal level, a cultural level, I would have to think about that more before I make any kind of, um, you know, um, daring statements um, that then um, I have to withdraw afterwards. So I, I think I'll stop here. No, I mean, I appreciate, I think we all appreciate your honesty and your candor in answering that question. Uh, it, it's definitely not an easy thing when doing any sort of research. Um, but the, the next question I wanted to ask uh, comes from Ben Nick, and um, they're more curious to hear about the history of writing queer history in Germany. Uh, their question is, uh, have there been similar traditions of lesbian and gay, queer, trans studies embedded in universities um, as there have been in the UK and US? So reflected in uh, German, Germany academia. Sorry, now I briefly have to ask back, kind of in the, in the most recent time or kind of further back? I think it's referring to recent time, like modern sort of study. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, I, I would say there still is a difference. Um, it's, it's, yeah, German academia might be lagging behind a bit. Um, there's always been fantastic research on queer history, but for a long time in Germany, that research has been done outside of academia and people kind of often in very precarious situations um, kind of, you know, had to organize their fundings. They did, did uh, exhibitions, publication projects, but did not have kind of the comfort of, of a chair as I do at the moment, right? Um, so the, um, I think in, in the US and in the UK, you can also see that trajectory, but I think um, queer history research moved, especially in the US, um, earlier into kind of the recognized sphere and, and the, well, more or less well-paid sphere um, of, of um, um, official academia. Um, so I think, Germany is, is now on the way to catch up in that respect. Um, it also, I think it also has to do something with history because history can be a, a conservative discipline, not at Goldsmiths, luckily, great, right? But in other places um, and um, especially contemporary history, I think took a long time to acknowledge diversity. That's not just um, about sexual diversity and queerness, that's also um, you know, race, ethnicity, disability, all these kinds of questions for a long time did not figure uh, big in contemporary history in Germany as it was done at the universities. So I think, um, you know, I, I think we're witnessing a moment where things change, but there is still a lot of work to be done. Thanks, Benno. I've got a question now from another friend of the program. Um, I, I see a question from Alison Oram, um, realizing that you're giving a national overview, but uh, Alison wondered if you could comment on regional differences in, in activism and memory, most obviously East and West formerly, but also North and South. Um, and of course, we know Alison is influenced by uh, really interesting work on locality and regionality in, in queer history in Britain. So of course, it's um, interesting to hear your perspectives on, on these issues in, in Germany. Absolutely, um, and, and, and absolutely crucial, especially as the East-West is concerned. That's kind of the most obvious in the German case. Um, and there's a couple of things I, I did not even mention. It's, it's kind of the, the usual narrative is that things happened in the West, and then maybe they were kind of copied in the East in the 70s and 80s. Um, but finally, kind of after reunification, um, kind of, you know, East Germany was catching up. That's often the idea. And it's so untrue, especially when you look at queer history. Right, because um, first of all, there has been, as, as, as I said, emancipatory groups, and especially in the 1980s, there is kind of, um, you also see in the GDR, you see media coverage about homosexuality emerging then. Um, but then most importantly, actually, kind of I mentioned the infamous paragraph 175. Um, it was finally, finally um, abolished in 1994. And that was due to reunification. Um, but not that kind of the East was catching up to the West. It was exactly the other way around. So it was um, in the last years of the GDR that they finally um, finished um, um, the uh, discrimination of same-sex desiring people in the criminal law, actually in 1988, 1989. It's, so it's even before the revolution. Um, and then in the course of reunification, when the criminal law of West and East Germany were kind of brought together, then finally, um, in West Germany, they also managed to get rid of that paragraph. So it's, it's actually kind of the East that took the lead. Also kind of the organization I mentioned, the, the LSVD, the um, Lesben Schulenverband Deutschland, is um, um, founded in, in Leipzig, in East Germany in 1990, before reunification. So kind of that, that's one aspect of the regional. Um, the North-South, it's, that's, it's different in, you know, it's not like in, in, in England, in Germany, but you definitely have more industrial regions and more rural regions and more agricultural regions. And generally that's something I've looked at, kind of the rural is thought to be lagging behind, nothing happening there. People have to escape the countryside in order to kind of, you know, um, grow up to the expectation of a really fully fledged gay and lesbian lifestyle in the big city. Um, and that is of course also, it's not true in England, it's not true in Germany either. Um, but that is something that is hardly um, commemorated. So kind of, I came across small groups in, in small towns, like groups of 10 people, 
Um, I mean, I found them through oral history interviews. There's some coverage in the gay kind of magazines from the 1970s, but that is definitely a tradition um, that deserves more attention. A bit better is the situation with the land, uh, lesbian land movement. That is also one of those kind of regional specificities that happened in England as well and in other countries and uh, in West Germany as well. So kind of lesbian women taking to the countryside, founding kind of um, communities in the countryside in order to um, get away from all men and get away from capitalism, basically, basically which they associate, associate with the urban um, and the large cities. So there, um, there are some possible references for kind of coming up with more memories um, that kind of move beyond the metronormative framework that we usually um, um, follow in queer history and um, queer memory. Thank you, Benno, for that. Um, the next question comes from Jack King, um, who asks how significant an impact to, did different from the others have on queer slash gay visibility and liberation in 1910s and 20s Germany? It was seen by many people, right? Um, so it definitely did, did have... Um, uh, an impact, but again, it, 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 it's kind of, you know, ambivalent. Um, I mean, that film also clearly has a class bias um, in how it depicts that story of kind of the um, young man who's kind of from a lower class background and who's kind of blackmailing, blackmailing the successful middle class respectable man. Um, so, even in the film's own terms, it's not kind of a big achievement for all parts of the queer spectrum, but kind of a very class specific kind of, right? It's, it's kind of the respectable middle class homosexuals. They should kind of benefit from, from this kind of publicity. Um, but then, you know, I mean, people might have seen it and, you know, they, everybody does their own thing with what they see. Um, I had an interview with a guy who talks about kind of sexual education films in the 1970s, where for the first time in the, in the cinema, you would see a naked human body, male, male body um, in that case. And, you know, that was not at all intended to trigger any kind of homosexual erotic thoughts, but in his case, it did. So who knows what, what people thought, felt, um, and did with the experience of seeing different from the others. Um, again, I think um, it could go in many different directions, but it certainly had an impact and it was an important um, first step in the kind of increasing visibility um, of same-sex desiring and gender non-conforming subcultures um, in the Weimar period. Thanks, Benno. Uh, I, I want to go back to a second question that uh, uh, that Jen Evans had, um, and there's been a couple follow-ons uh, from it. You're going to have to go back through the uh, the chat when this is all over. There's uh, it's really quite. Uh, can I can I ask you something in between? Um, is is that kind of archived? Because um, I I can't read it at the moment, and um, I will have to leave after this right away because we are getting closer to the curfew in Italy. Remember, ten o'clock. So I have I have to leave like in. 10 minutes, if that's okay. Okay, that's a great reminder on our timelines too. And all of this will be available. Someone else had asked if it was being recorded and it will be uh, continuing to be a bit, uh, to be available. And a lot of these are on the uh, the YouTube channel. And they're going to be timestamped with, uh, uh, with the talk. So they'll be showing up along those lines. So you can go back and review them as well. Perfect, nothing's lost. Exactly, we're, we're archiving it all. Um, so going back to, uh, to Jen's question, um, Jen Evans, um, whom you also know, uh, was asking, how has memory opened up even more when we move beyond queer and trans as an identity? So trans asterisk versus trans in the Haberstam or Stryker sense. Um, Kate Davison was asking further about uh, 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 about trans asterisk versus trans history and, and really building from your title about um, how good and bad this was for different groups of people within the LGBTQ population. All right, uh, and, and now I'll do that in three minutes. Um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think this is one of the points, uh, definitely, um, where one could, um, I think dig deeper is the wrong metaphor, right? Um, where one could further unfold things. Um, 
because this is also a question about kind of the trans dimensions of what we often usually mostly perceive of as part of gay history or part of lesbian history. I mean, if you think of um, the, the, the um, ladies club Violetta uh, and the kind of gender performances there. Um, and, and I think it is really, um, it is really, there, there's a lot of career potential Right, because um, you could even then broaden it to include people that usually we never um, think about when we talk about queer history and queer people in the past. Um, so I'm definitely in favor of going going further with, the, with those um, words, with those categories, um, than using them as identity markers. I probably have done that over large stretches of the talk. Um, so that would be the next um, 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 the next step. And, and then, of course, um, there's a, a huge potential for playing with words um, um, by using words like transhistorical and, and kind of contact across time, um, which might often sound a bit cheesy, but I think, I think really, I mean, it's, a lot of conceptual work, very productive work, very fruitful work has been done with this kind of notion of trance if you broaden it out. So that probably, um, if, if, if I, which actually I will do, so thanks a lot for the suggestion, um, that is definitely one of the paths um, um, that um, makes a lot of sense to, to, to follow further and to see where that leads, um, to take that notion of transness more serious to broaden it out in terms of the groups it's applied to and in terms of the effects it can have also in terms of looking at the temporal dynamics, right? So trans temporality in the end uh, potentially as well. But now I, I kind of, I'm close to not understanding myself what I say. So I, I, I better shut up. Thanks for that, Benno. Jen has responded with a very enthusiastic yes, but I think it was to your answer and not to shutting up. <laughs> um, there is, yeah, much more that you can come back to. I'm mindful of the the time and uh, and how much we could have, uh, uh, well, kept you here asking more. There literally is, I've been scrolling through and there's probably another dozen really engaging, exciting, thought-provoking questions um, aside from anything else that uh, that Holly and I would, would have wanted to pose to you as well. Um, and and again, just so much support and friendliness from a lot of names you'll recognize when you when you when you go back through this year yourself. So I think I just want to uh, take this opportunity to to wind things up to thank you so much, Benno, for sharing your time with us for delivering the fourth uh, Goldsmiths uh, Queer History Lecture and uh, uh, really for your time with us at Goldsmiths and all that you contributed to launching the the MA Queer History and the Center for for queer history and just what a delight it's been to uh, to have you join us again here tonight um, and also to thank Holly for co-hosting uh, this evening and uh, to the Goldsmiths History Society for for all the work that you're doing and what you've really brought to the department this year um, it's really just been uh, fantastic to have such such engaged and engaging students part of the uh, well continuing to be part of the program so thank you to Holly uh, and 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 the rest of the, uh, the the students in our department um so with that I, I I wind things up on another successful annual lecture I I really look forward to uh, future events with with all of you um, follow our, our Facebook page. There's more events coming up, including a workshop on uh, uh, on, on queer publications in the German-speaking world later this week. Um, so there's uh, we're, we're, we we haven't done much for a while, but we've hit the ground running at this point in the term. So thank you again so much, Benno and Holly, and thank you so much to all, all of you that have joined us. And I see your thanks. Uh, and <laughs> can I, can I just like also? Yes, also yes. say, well, thanks to you, Chester, and thanks to Holly um, and, and everybody else for being here. And, and uh, you know, I, I will read through all that. And um, 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 it was really exciting. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's always been a wonderful place and continues to be a wonderful place where you need meet a great, fantastic people. Um, so um, this this is this is why uh, why this is uh, so wonderful and great and I was really happy to be here. Um, thanks to all of you. I love you as well. And um, now we should go for drinks and nibbles, right? 
<laughs> if, well, we will definitely be uh, raising virtual glasses to you. We can't have the champagne reception this year, but uh, I think I'm going to go and have a drink now and, uh, and, and, and toast you, Benno. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thank you.